Lord, we um, honor you today. We lift you high. Lord, there's no one else we can turn to. Thank you, Jesus. You're, uh, you're an incredible God. And Lord, we just ask that you would touch us all as individuals. You know exactly what we're going through. And just as the song was, we went over this morning about the sometimes through uh, a storm and sometimes through um, waters and there's a fire, Lord. But Lord, you're still there. Thank you, Jesus. You're that still small voice and you want to speak to every one of us. Lord, give us hearts that want to listen to you today. We pray, Lord, that you just minister through the words that Jeff brings and minister, Lord, through the remainder of this service. And Lord, let us carry the unique anointing that you want to touch us with today. Yes, Lord. Throughout the rest of this week. Lord, this is this the rest of this week is our ministry time. So our Lord, we ask that you would equip us mm-hmm. and strengthen us. And Lord, you know those that are Lord not present with us today. And you know what their needs. Lord, you know what they uh, they need from you. And so Lord, we ask, Lord, your hand would go out to them right now in Jesus' name. We thank you and we are careful to give you all the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Roger. Well, um, talking about the secrets of the kingdom, we're still in our parable uh, series. They're the stories that Jesus told. And the parables really are a way um, for Jesus to disclose what God is like. He said the kingdom is like, meaning that the, the God of the kingdom is like this. He acts this way. His character is mercy. His character is grace. His character is generosity and celebration and forgiveness. And we looked at all those things in the stories that Jesus told. Wonderful description of who God is and how God acts uh, in our world and toward us. But when the parables also confront us with the reality that with an invitation, an invitation that because God acts in this way, you and I, as his kids, as his children, those you and I who are image bearers made in the image of God, we also would act in similar ways, just as God is, so we would be in the world. These are the ways he was, and this is the way we are meant, or is in the way we are meant to be. It's the way we honor his rule and honor his reign in our lives by living in similar ways as he does. Last week and the week before, Donna talked to you about the prodigal son. And I'm sure she said that the point of the prodigal son is that we would end up with the father's heart, right? Did you say that, Donna? I haven't listened to your message. Very good. You said that. I'm sure you would have. And yes, sometimes we act like the older brother, don't we? Judgmental and hard and not easily pleased. We act like the older brother at times. And sometimes we find ourselves like the younger brother in a far off land spiritually. Sometimes we're like that. But the main character in the story of the prodigal son, the main example, the exemplar for our lives is the father. We're meant to have the father's heart toward all the prodigals uh, in our lives and the prodigal that is uh, within all of us. Sometimes the forgiveness we need to offer is to ourselves. You see, when we receive the kingdom, when we acknowledge God's reign and the salvation that it brings into our lives, we're also accepting the responsibility that comes with naming Christ as the king of our lives. When we become citizens of the kingdom, we get enlisted in kingdom purposes. And in the parable that we're going to look at today, we'll discover that... um, How well we get on with God's purposes means either judgment or reward. How how well we get on with the purposes of the kingdom in our life will mean either judgment or reward. It's a story found in a section of Matthew's gospel where Jesus is preparing his disciples for his eventual leaving. He starts by telling him then that the hour of his return is not known to anyone. It's only known to the Father. 
So what are they supposed to do between the time that he leaves and the time that he returns? Well, he tells them they're supposed to be wise in the way that they live because they don't know the hour of the Lord's return. They're supposed to be wise. They're also supposed to be watchful. And that's the story of the ten virgins. That's the parable of the ten virgins. You don't want to miss the hour because you were unprepared. And then thirdly, he talks to them about you have to be faithful while you're waiting, you have to be faithful because his, his, at his return, there'll be a reckoning on how you used your time while he was away. And that's the parable of the talents, and that's the parable that we're going to look at today. This past week, um, my dad and I and my brother went to um, Lake Baptiste uh, to, uh, watch, uh, to um, uh, do some bass fishing. And... Um, we, after a day of fishing, we, got, we pulled up back to the dock, and there was this guy on a jet ski, young guy, on a jet ski tied up to the dock, and he had his head over top of the handlebars, and I thought, what a strange sight, you know, a beautiful sunny day, and there's this kid was with his head on the thing. It looked like he'd maybe be broke up with his girlfriend or something like that, or maybe he lost his puppy or something. He looked just really sad and really forlorn. So he said to the guy, like, beautiful day, uh, jet ski. What's going on? Like, what are you doing here tied up to the dock, you know? He said, well, I rented this jet ski. It cost me $350 for the day, for this jet ski. I got down this end of the lake and ran out of gas. I've been here for hours. And he said, you're the first people to pull into the thing. And so well, my dad said, well, I, I've got gas. So I went and got the car, and I came down, and we gave him gas, and off he took off. He took off. I'm wondering if there's just some Christians just waiting around for someone to show up and save them with their head down, sad, and just trying to get through. They don't know how it's going to work out, but they're just trying to get through life. Jesus doesn't want us to be like that guy just hanging around this earth and our lives, just waiting for someone to come and save us from this terrible predicament that we find ourselves in. Sad and forlorn, like we lost our girlfriend or puppy or boyfriend or whatever. We have something to do, amen, while we're here. Not just hanging around, wasting time. And to set the expectation, Jesus tells them this story. Matthew 25. Starting to read at verse 14. Again, it will be like, and when Jesus says it will be like, he's, he's really talking about the kingdom. The kingdom, this is what it will be like in the kingdom. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one who had two talents gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought another five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in, in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And the man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See? Here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not sown seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers 
so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he, and he will have an, abund an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him and thrown that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a story about a CEO. If we want to modernize it, it's a story about a CEO who calls three employees into his office and tells them he's going away and he puts them in charge of the operation while he's gone. He hands each of them a portfolio, and in it is what each of them is responsible for in his absence. We'll start with the fella who has one talent. He's a junior executive, given a division of the company that's worth one talent. Now, one talent in Jesus' day was a, equivalent to about a half a lifetime's worth of work. So to say, let's say 20, 25 years worth of work. If you do the math, and there's no perfect equivalence today that from then, but it's no small amount. A modern executive, for a modern executive, that equate to about $800,000. So no small amount, right? One talent is $800,000. That's how big his portfolio is. To the next employee, sharp fella, hasn't been with the company very long, but he's proved himself. He gets a division of the company that's worth two talents. His portfolio is valued at a million six. And the last folder goes to a senior executive. And because of her service and experience, she gets five talents, four million dollars to manage. And you'll know that each is given a different amount. And Jesus says it's given based on ability. Ability. We'll say a little more about that later on. The CEO knows his people. He knows what they're good at. And they are tasked accordingly. But despite the differences in each portfolio, what each portfolio represents is a tremendous opportunity, right? Is a tremendous opportunity for these employees to show initiative, to use their judgment, to use their skill in the market, and, and, really, ra and really rise to the potential that the owner of the company sees in them. That's why he handed that money out to them. And even to the junior executive, I mean, it's no small thing. $800,000 you just don't give to anybody. Have you ever been reluctant to give somebody money on the street? And you thought to yourself, well, I don't want to give them $5 because they might waste it. Five bucks, people, come on. Imagine giving someone $800,000. You have to have a lot of trust in that person. A lot of confidence. This is a chance of a lifetime to grow in their capacity and their ability and to reap some of the return if they do well. It's not an opportunity to squander. So what happens with their assignments? Well, we'll go the other way now. The one with the five talent, the Bible says at once they went and put it to work. They made their money back again. They gained more. That four million become eight million. Pretty impressive. Eight million dollars. And the one with two talents did exactly the same. They doubled it to six million. A million six, rather. In the absence of their boss, these two employees seized the moment. This is what they were given to do. This is what their boss trusted them to do. 
And in a real sense, they too trusted their boss. They trusted their boss and the confidence that was put in them. And now it was their time to actually live out the potential that the boss seen in them. They were going to make the most of it because the boss believed in them. Do you believe we have one who believes in us? Uh, we believe in God, yes, but does he believe in us? We can't say that about the junior executive, can we? He does nothing with what he is given. 800,000 is plenty of capital to work with, isn't it? But he buries it. He buries it. What does that action say about burying the talent? It tells us that he doesn't trust the CEO. He doesn't trust the CEO's confidence in him. Instead, he sees his boss as a person not who shows great generosity and faith in giving him this opportunity. Rather, he dishonors the gift and he dishonors himself and the giver of the gift. I would suggest that the first two servants honored the gift that they were given as a way of honoring their master. You see what I'm saying? We honor our master by, we honor the gift by, and in the process, honor our master. And in, in that way, the first two servants, the five talent servant and the two talent servant, in that way they act out in love. Where the one talent servant dishonored the gift and his master and therefore acted in fear. Henry Nouwen, in one of his books on, um, I think it's called Fecundity. It's a book about uh, fecundity, abundance. He says that fear always leads to sterility. Fear only ever results in unfruitfulness. Think about that for your life. When you're wrestling with fears, it won't actually produce anything life-giving in your life. But love, love only produces more. It's hard work, but it only produces more. The time comes for the CEO to return, and upon his return, he wants an update on how things have gone while he's, while he's been gone. The one with five talents shows him the balance sheet. He points to the bottom line, and he says to the master, Master, you entrusted me with five, but see, I've gained uh, five more. And for that faithfulness, for that work of, of, of taking what he's been given and, and making more of it, uh, she receives that uh, well done. Congratulations for your faithfulness. I have more in store for you. Come and share in the increase that you have brought to my kingdom. Share in all that we are building together. And the one with two talents, same commendation. All, of my, all that is mine is open to you, says the, says the CEO. Share in your master's happiness. You notice that even though they are given different amounts, isn't the reward exactly the same? The war is exactly the same. It's not portioned like our world. If you do this in the world, you get that back out. The kingdom says you do what God asks you to do. You share in all that God has for all of us. It tells us that when it comes to recompense, when it comes to reward, it doesn't matter what you've been given. It matters what you do with it. The reward is the same, and faithfulness is the key. Faithfulness is the key. And that means, if that's the case, that means that there is no room for comparison with others. We're always comparing ourselves with other people and what they have or what they don't have. The truth is that there will always be someone or some group, 
or some person who is better off in our eyes, right? They're smarter, they're funnier, they're prettier, they're more athletic, they had more opportunities, they came from a better family, they had better parents, all that stuff. But the kingdom secret is this, that it doesn't matter what your gifts are, your resources, your, uh, your abilities, your opportunities. It doesn't matter what they are. What matters is what you do with them. That's what matters. The one talent is an opportunity. The two talent is an opportunity. The, three, the five talent is an opportunity to do more with it, to do more. And they, and they are the same and we are provided the same occasion to do something with them, something that God has for us to do in this world. So there is no room for comparison because it's God who determines what we get. You know, when we're comparing ourselves with others, it's like saying to the giver of the gifts, well, you shortchanged me. But how many know what is the fundamental truth that God is good and that God gives us everything we need for our life? And so you're, whatever that was, even the difficult, hard things, he's allowed them for a reason. I don't, that's beyond me. That's beyond my pay grade to know why that is the case. But it is the case. It's what we do with it. And we can't point a finger at the, the clay, can't point to the, to, the, to the potter and say, why are you doing this with me? It's God who determines that. And he can make something beautiful out of any of us and all of us. Comparing will not do anything for us except take our eyes off the giver of the gift and cause us to focus on lesser things. The two faithful servants did not do that. They focused on what the master had given them to do. So can I encourage someone today, I don't know who you are or who needs to hear this today, can I encourage you, it's a different metaphor, but run your own race. Run your own race. Don't be looking to the left or to the right and this person had this opportunity and that person's better at that and, and woe is me. No, run your own race. Run your own race. I don't know who that's for today, but you've been looking to both sides and you've been saying, oh, it's never going to happen for me. And no, whatever God has for you, it's yes and amen in Christ Jesus. It's yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So run your own race. There's no reward for pointing fingers at others. No reward, none. The junior exec doesn't fare as well in terms of, of um, reward as the as the uh, the other two faithful servants. Uh, he has shown he has nothing to show his master. In fact, he starts his his um, accounting of what he's done while the master was away, he starts by criticizing the master's character and faulting his business practices. He says, you're a hard man. Instead of seeing as a generous man, he says, you're a, you're a hard man. You harvest where you have not sown and you gather where you have not scattered seed. He started... <laughs> I've been learning, uh, been joining a conversation, as I told you before, uh, next door with the Greenwood folks, and we've been learning about ABCD, Asset-Based Community Development. A really fun conversation with a group of people I've never met before. And, and one of the truths that we're learning uh, as we look at our community and how do, we, how do we cause a community to flourish, one of the things that we've been learning is one of the, the roadblocks to, to doing this sort of thing is, in fact, our deficit mentality. We have a deficit mentality often. And the way they describe that um, is that we tend to focus on what's wrong and not what's strong. Don't we say about kids who are having trouble and they're involved in gangs or they're in poverty, don't we say that's an 
at-risk group of young people. Well, guess what? You can keep, call people at-risk people. They'll live in risky ways. All right? Or we say that's an under-resourced neighborhood or that's a challenged community over there. But as long as we talk about each other in these demeaning ways, then people will live out demeaning lives. We don't start with what's wrong. We start with what's strong. One talent is different than five, but they both represent opportunity. And even the person who is struggling and seems to have less can make more of their lives. But we tend to, we tend to diminish people. The junior executive has exactly this kind of mentality. He looks at his boss and says, you're hard. This is what's wrong. Not the $800,000 stuck in his pocket that he could do, or his portfolio, that he could do something with. It's the mindset of scarcity. And where does it come from? It comes from a place of fear. It comes from a place of fear. He could have at least put it in the bank, his master says. But even a GIC is scary to this guy. I'm assuming you all know what a GIC is. Even a GIC is scary to this guy. So instead of seeing the investment filled with promise to be released so that it can flourish, rather he sees it as a product to be guarded and then ultimately squandered. Uh, one of Aesop's fables is called The Miser, and it goes like this. A miser sold all his property and bought a mass of gold, which he buried in a secret place, to which he frequently visited for inspection. Someone who had noticed his coming and going found the treasure and carried it off. And when the miser returned and discovered his loss, he wailed and tore his hair in a frenzy of grief. Son, someone who saw him agonizing after learning the cause said to him, Don't grieve, my friend. Just take a stone and bury it in the same place and think of it as gold in a vault. For even when the gold was there, you made no use of it. <laughs> you can have all the potential in the world and God has given us all the potential we are meant to have for our world and yet when we bear it, it might as well be a stone buried in the ground. It's just left there. That's the junior executive. So when we hear the master's words of rebuke to his servant, yes, they seem harsh. And they're meant to be an exaggeration, so we're shocked by the reality of the situation. But what else do you do when someone dishonors the gift and dishonors the giver in the process? What else is there to do? Someone uh, flagrantly neglects what they've been so richly given. I think this parable teaches us that there's actually a sin of unrealized potential. A sin of unrealized potential. God cares deeply that you become all that you are meant to be and I become all that I'm meant to be and that we steward what we've been given to us to the highest form of flourishing. That's what faithfulness looks like and that's what reward will be based on. three truths that um, I want you to reflect on from this parable. The first one is there, there is a day of reckoning coming. There is a day of reckoning coming. Every one of us will give an account of what we've done with our lives. And based on this parable, I can tell you that God expects a return on the investment that he made in you. The gift that you are to this world. He expects a, 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 a ret an investment to have grown and had become something more than it was originally. Are you honoring the gift as a way of honoring the giver? Are you honoring the gift that is you and that you, that you possess as a way of honoring 
the giver. There is a day of reckoning coming. The second truth that I want you to, to reflect on is that when we are given gifts, we need to recognize our limits as well as our potential. We recognize our limits as well as our potential. See, we're all given different material to work with. Some of us will build a castle. Some of us will build an outhouse. You are all given different material. That's a reality, right? We're all given different material to work with. So you're not meant to do everything. But you are meant to do something with your life, with what you've been given. Some are five, some are two, some, are, uh, some of us are one talent people. And yes, the amount are different, but as I said before, the opportunity is the same. It's the same. And there's potential in every one of us. So what are you doing with that capacity that God has gifted you with? When you're not stewarding your gift... You are not only taking away from you, you are not becoming your true self. When you are not stewarding your gift, you're not only taking away from you, know that you're also taking away from the, from the very people that God intended you to serve while you were here. Did you know that? That's so important. It not only hurts you, it hurts those that God intended to serve through you. How many know he serves this world through us? We are his hands and feet. He's gone away. He's no longer here. In a physical sense, he works through his church. Um, Rumi is a, um, a Persian poet from the 12th century. He said this, If you are here unfaithfully with us, you are causing great damage. If you are here unfaithfully with us. In other words, you're not living out your true self. You are causing, his words, terrible damage. Wow. So there is a true cost, an everyday cost, when we are unfaithful to our true selves and to the one who provided all that we need to flourish in this life. So know your limits but also explore your potential as well. Lastly, your calling in life is not achieved. Your calling in life is received. It's received. I read a wonderful book by Par Parker Palmer. Anyone familiar with Parker Palmer? Um, over um, this, when I was on holidays, and um, he says in that book, it's the, the book is called uh, Let Your Life Speak. Um, and he says that we're often telling our lives what we want to do with them. We tell our lives what we want to do with them. Don't we ask young people, what do you want to do when you grow up? So a little boy says, oh, I'm a fireman. Well, I'm glad they're not all firemen because we'd have no one to be a business executives. Or they're not all peace officers. They're not all football stars. Or they're not all chefs or whatever it is that kids want to do we're, all, we're telling our lives what they will become but he says instead of telling our lives what they will be which is a sort of act of our will he said we should let our lives tell us what we're to be our lives in Christ let our lives speak to us and tell us what we should be are there some things that just cause you to be on fire and truly alive? That's who you were meant to be. That's why. And other things are, oh my goodness, if I have to do this for another two minutes, I'll die. Now, some of that thing's necessary because that's life. But that's not your true self. That's not who you were meant. Let your life speak. Listen to your life. Listen to what, what uh, inspires you, what directs you what empowers you and therefore blesses others in the process. It's not achieved, it's received. Did you know that the, the word vocation 
The Latin for vocation, hidden in that Latin word for vocation, is the word voice. Voice. Are you listening? So in other words, this is what Parker Palmer says. I wrote this down. Uh, Vocation uh, does not mean a goal I pursue. It means a calling I hear. As he walks with me and he talks with me. Right? Are you listening to the voice of the one who knows you and called you from eternity past, the one who set you apart as his beloved? Are you listening to what he's saying to you? As he hands you that portfolio and says, this is what I've tasked you to do with your life. This is what it's about. It's not achieved, it's received. So three things. There's reckoning coming. Know your limits and your potential, but that also that this, the voice of the one is, is asking you, please, take it, take it, live it. Explore it. Flourish in this place. Those three things. I want you to think about them. You know, as we look forward to uh, Grace Church's future uh, in this community, I really... I really see this parable as, as so important uh, because if, if we are at 50% of using our gift in this community, then we will see 50% of the return, right? right? I don't know if the math is exactly just like that, but it's something like that, isn't it? That if we're limping along in our capacities And the expression that we are meant to be collectively as a church, God's called us all together for a reason, right? If we're limping along at a certain capacity in this community, then we're going to reap that return. But I'm praying for a day when the the capacities of Grace Church are fully released. Amen? That we are all in step, all eight cylinders or six cylinders of your echo guy, living the four-cylinder electric car, whatever the metaphor is for you. That we're firing on all those cylinders individually and together. And we actually need each other. I need a Susan in my life to say, hey, Jeff, that one cylinder's not working. I want to call forth what is the best in you. I want to believe in you. I want to uh, invest in you. I want to call that forth and see you flourish. That's what we're here. That's why we need each other. Bear each other's burdens, walk with each other. But this this is key as we move forward in in, in reaching our community, that we would be a flourishing congregation. And I don't mean just numbers, although it wouldn't hurt to have a few more people here. I don't mean just in numbers. I mean just in in, in the way we're relating uh, in personally and then to our community. And I know we have a lot of retired people here, and we've... I'm sorry, but some of you bought into the myth that, well, I've done my job. I've done my part. I don't need to remind you that the master's not returned yet. He never said, get to 65 or 60 or 55 if you're, if you're fortunate enough. He never said, get to 55 and then coast the rest of the way and I'll meet you on the other end. He never said that, did he? They worked while it was still day and they kept working until the end yes you may change hats as you're retired but there's still so much that you have to offer your family this church and your community i don't want you to i don't want you to be like that kid on that that jet ski head down on thing going woe is me i'm just waiting to get taken out of this terrible situation I want you on that jet ski flying like a crazy man. Living your life to the full, flourished. I think this is an important message as we go forward um, for our our community. So, So Lord, I'm calling forth. I'm calling forth all the giftings and capacities and powers that that uh, reside in this congregation. Some are in dormant form, Lord. Some need to be shaken and wakened up. They've been there since childhood, but they've yet to be discovered and really grown, Lord. So, Lord, I I call them forth, and I ask that you would um, be 
pouring water and you would pouring sunshine and there would be life and vitality and newness and a freshness, Lord. Lord, there are dreams that have been buried in this congregation. Lord, I'm, I'm calling that those dreams would be released and that there might be a fulfillment and a manifestation of all that you desire for us at Grace Church in our individual lives, in our relation with others. And Lord, some of the gifts that are at Grace Church have been smothered by woundedness and hurt. There's been sin against some people here, and because of that sin, they've buried that gift. And when they tried to use that gift, they were criticized. But Lord, today you're calling it out, calling it forth. And you're releasing it. And they're learning, they will learn by your grace to trust again, to try again, to fulfill. And Lord, that gift that has been um, pushed down by apathy, they say, I've done my part. Lord, I pray a, a passion and a strength to develop in those people today to live fully what you have called them to do. And Lord, for that one who is on the wrong path, who has made their life but has not listened to their life, I pray that you would speak clearly to them today through this message and through your Spirit's work and their ongoing work in their life. And Lord, and redirect them back on the path that is truly them. Truly the gift that you meant to bring to this world through them. Lord, we're horrified by the, by the verdict of this junior executive, wicked and lazy servants. Lord, we, we're horrified by that verdict over his life. We want to be those who receive the well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we're looking forward to our master's happiness and bringing all that we are meant to bring into that. Lord, you need nothing, but you invite us to share in everything. Lord, come and awaken your people. And everyone said, Amen.